So thank you for having me. I'm happy to be a part of the Healthy Aging Speakers Series. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm Kate Rickey. Um, as Ali mentioned, the owner of a non-medical home care agency here in Larimer County, Home Helpers. I also volunteer at the Alzheimer Association and sit on the committee for the Walk to End Alzheimer's. And today I'm going to share some 2021 statistics regarding Alzheimer's. Then we'll talk about the stages we encounter through the progression of the disease, benefits of early diagnosis, 10 warning signs to look out for versus typical brain changes, risk factors, and then we're going to pivot and review best practices for caregivers, including a daily schedule, caregiver stress, legal and financial planning, and end of life planning. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, a general term referring to memory loss. There are no known cures, but treatments for symptoms are available and research continues. Abducanumab, also known as Adulam, is the first FDA approved therapy that addresses the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease rather than only addressing the symptoms. There does remain some controversy in the scientific community regarding its effectiveness, but it's worth mentioning that um, it does, it is now out there. Here are the latest and greatest stats from the Alzheimer's Association. As you can see, more than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. Deaths associated with Alzheimer's and dementia decreased 16% since the beginning of the pandemic. In the past decade, deaths from heart disease decreased 7.3%, yet deaths from Alzheimer's disease increased 145%. And over 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for someone with Alzheimer's. Large numbers of non-white Americans report major barriers, including discrimination, regarding access to care and treatment. There are three stages of Alzheimer's disease, early, middle, and late. The symptoms of Alzheimer's worsen over time, although the rate at which it progresses varies. On average, a person with Alzheimer's lives four to eight years after diagnosis, but may live as long as another 20 years. The stages are separated into three categories and provide an overall idea of how abilities change once symptoms appear. In the early stages, or what's known as mild Alzheimer's, the individual will likely still function independently, meaning they can still drive and go to work and engage in social activities. The memory lapses are more noticeable, so friends and family might notice difficulties trouble remembering words or names, forgetting recently read materials, or losing or misplacing a valuable object. During this early stage, it's possible for people with dementia to live well by taking control of their health and wellness and focusing their energy on aspects of their life that are most meaningful to them. In addition, this is the ideal time to put legal, financial, and end-of-life plans in place because the person with dementia will be able to participate in that decision-making. In the middle stages or moderate Alzheimer's, the individual may be forgetful of their personal history, have more frustration and anger. They may act in unexpected ways like not taking care of personal hygiene, increased suspiciousness, compulsive repetitive behaviors. During this stage, there is damage to the nerve cells in the brain occurring, which um, leads to difficulty expressing thoughts, difficulty performing routine tasks, and sometimes difficulty recalling common items like their address, phone number, or an important historical event in their life. In this middle stage, the person living with Alzheimer's can still participate in daily activities with assistance. It's important to find out what the person can still do or find ways to simplify tasks as the need for more care will increase Family caregivers may want to consider respite care or an adult daycare center so they have that temporary break from caregiving while the person living with Alzheimer's continues to receive care in a safe environment. In the late stages or severe Alzheimer's, the ability to respond to the environment is lost. Um, significant personality changes may occur. Extensive help is needed with daily activities. The person may become vulnerable to infections, especially pneumonia and will eventually experience changes in physical abilities like walking, sitting, and swallowing. The person living with Alzheimer's may not be able to initiate engagement as much during the late stage, 
but he or she can still benefit from interaction in ways that are appropriate, like listening to relaxing music or re receiving reassurance through gentle touch. There are many benefits to an early diagnosis, including time to plan and define one's choices and a better chance of benefiting from treatment. So the 10 warning signs, if you notice any of these signs, you should take action. Number one is memory loss that disrupts daily life. So forgetting recently learned information, important dates or events, asking the same question repeatedly, needing to rely on memory aids like reminder notes or electronic devices. Now, occasionally forgetting names or appointments and remembering them later is normal and not a warning sign of Alzheimer's. Number two is challenges in planning or solving problems. The ability to develop and follow a plan or work with numbers diminishes. There may be trouble following a familiar recipe or keeping track of bills, difficulty concentrating or taking longer to do things versus a typical change, which is making an occasional error when my managing finances or household bills. Number three, Difficulty completing familiar tasks. So it might be hard to complete a routine task or drive to a familiar location, organize a grocery list, or remember the rules of a favorite game versus a typical brain change, which might be occasionally needing help to use the microwave settings or to record a TV show. Number four is confusion with time or place. So losing track of dates, seasons, time of day, trouble understanding a concept when it's not immediately happening. Um, they may forget where they are, how they got there, versus a typical change, which is getting confused about the day of the week, but then being able to figure it out later. Number five is trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. So vision problems, problems judging distance, determining color or contrast, and issues with driving versus a typical change, which would be vision changes related to cataracts. Number six is new problems with words. For example, stopping in the middle of a conversation with no idea how to continue or repeating themselves. They may struggle with vocabulary or have trouble naming a familiar object or use the wrong name. Occasionally having trouble finding the right word is not a warning sign of Alzheimer's. Number seven, misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. Um, might find you're putting things in unusual places, losing items, unable to retrace steps, accusing others of stealing, especially as the disease progresses, versus the typical change, which is misplacing things from time to time and being able to retrace your steps to find them. Number eight is decreased or poor judgment. For example, they may use poor judgment when dealing with money or pay less attention to grooming or keeping themselves clean versus a typical change, which is making a bad decision once in a while, like neglecting to change the oil in the car. A person living with Alzheimer's may experience changes in the ability to hold or follow a conversation. As a result, he or she may withdraw from hobbies, social activities, or other engagements, and they may have trouble keeping up with a favorite team or activity versus a typical change, which would be sometimes feeling uninterested in family or social obligations. Individuals living with Alzheimer's may experience mood and personality changes. They may be easily upset at home, at work, with friends, or when out of their comfort zone. However, developing very specific ways of doing things and becoming irritable when the routine is disrupted is considered normal. Looking at the risk factors for Alzheimer's, age, the percentage of people with Alzheimer's dementia increases dramatically with age, with 5.3% of people age 65 to 74, 13.8% of people age 75 to 84, and 34.6% of people aged 85 plus. Genetics, researchers have found several genes that increase the risk of Alzheimer's, the APOE4 gene is the gene with the strongest impact on risk of late onset, onset Alzheimer's. Carrying the gene increases one's risk of developing Alzheimer's, but does not guarantee that an individual will develop Alzheimer's. Family history of Alzheimer's is not necessary for an individual to develop the disease. 
However, individuals who have a parent or a sibling with Alzheimer's are more likely to develop the disease than those who do not. Although age, genetics, and family history cannot be changed, other risk factors can be changed or modified to reduce the risk of cognitive decline in dementia, like diet, exercise, and no smoking. Caregivers for Alzheimer's and dementia face special challenges. Caring for a person with Alzheimer's or dementia often involves a team of people. As Alzheimer's progresses, your role as a caregiver changes and the person will eventually need assistance with daily living. Routines are very helpful for both the caregiver and the person living with Alzheimer's. And here on the slide are a few activities to consider for that routine. Here are some suggestions for a daily schedule. Best suited for someone in early to middle stages of Alzheimer's? A planned out day allows you to spend less time trying to figure out what to do and more time on activities that provide meaning and enjoyment. So I'll keep it here for a moment so you can see all the ideas. But in general, if the person seems bored, distracted, or irritable, it may be time to introduce another activity or to take time out for rest. The type of activity and how well it's completed are not as important as the joy and sense of accomplishment the person gets from doing it. Those in middle to late stages of Alzheimer's may need more assistance with activities of daily living. At this stage, it's ideal to have a trained and experienced caregiver to aid in additional care, including bathing and personal hygiene, dressing and glooming, grooming, excuse me, dental and denture care, light exercise and movement, music, art, other creative outlets, and medication safety. As the disease progresses, so may the needs of the person living with Alzheimer's. This is often a tough decision for the family if the wishes of the person living with Alzheimer's has not been documented. Residential care includes assisted living and memory care communities. These different types of facilities provide different levels of care depending on the person's needs. In-home care allows a person with Alzheimer's to stay in a familiar environment. It also can be a great assistance to family caregivers. Be mindful that anyone diagnosed with Alzheimer's may experience one or many of these uncharacteristic behaviors. Anyone experiencing behavioral symptoms should receive a thorough medical checkup, especially when the symptoms appear suddenly. When you're responding, don't get upset. Try to identify the immediate cause. What may have triggered that behavior? Be positive and reassuring. Speak slowly and in a soft tone. Caregiving can be overwhelming. It's important to have a support network to take care of your own well being. So, to the caregivers on the line, please take care of yourself. Eat well, exercise. Familiar, familiarize yourself with the resources that are available. Be realistic. Take friends and family up on their offers to help and accept the changes that occur. Educate yourself about Alzheimer's and how to assist during the progression of the disease. I'll give some examples which might help you to identify these signs of caregiver stress. So denial about the disease and it's the effect it has on the person who's been diagnosed. Like, I know mom's going to get better. Anger at the person with Alzheimer's or frustration that he or she can't do the things they used to be able to do. He knows how to get dressed. He's just being stubborn. Social withdrawal from friends and activities that used to make you feel good. So I don't care about visiting with the neighbors anymore. Anxiety about the future and facing another day. What happens when he needs more care than I can provide? Depression that breaks your spirit and affects your ability to cope. I just don't care anymore. Exhaustion that makes it nearly impossible to complete necessary daily tasks. I'm too tired for this. Sleeplessness caused by a never ending list of concerns. What if she wanders out of the house or falls and hurts herself? Irritability that leads to moodiness and triggers negative responses and actions. Leave me alone. Lack of concentration that makes it difficult to perform familiar tasks. I was so busy, I forgot my appointment. Or health problems that begin to take a mental and physical toll. I can't remember the last time I felt good. 
please take down the 24 seven hotline number. If you are a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's or other dementia and call for yourself, if you need resources, or if you're at your wits end, uh, they, they will have your back. And it's a very supportive crew that mans this line. The sooner you establish your legal plans, the better prepared you and your family will be. Um, then you can focus on enjoying your life moving forward. Power of attorney does not give your agent the authority to override your decision making. You maintain the right to make your own decisions as long as you have legal capacity. Legal capacity is the ability to understand and appreciate the consequences of one's actions and to make rational decisions. A power of attorney for healthcare allows you to name a healthcare agent to make healthcare decisions on your behalf when you are no longer able. POLST, P-O-L-S-T, is a standardized medical order form that indicates the specific types of life-sustaining treatment you do or do not want if seriously ill. This is a physician order, so it must be completed and signed by your physician. Advanced directives are legal documents that allow a person to document preferences regarding treatment and care, including end-of-life wishes, like a durable power of attorney or for health care or the living will. A living will, which is a type of advanced directive, expresses your wishes for what medical treatment you want or do not want near the end of life, such as life prolonging treatments. I don't know if any of you have heard of five wishes. This is a very easy to use advanced directive. It's a legal document in most states, including Colorado. The five wishes are one, the person I want to make decisions for me when I can't. Two, the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want. Three, how comfortable do I want to be? Four, how I want people to treat me. And five, what I want my loved ones to know. A standard will provides information about how your estate will be distributed upon death. A living trust is the other document that provides direction about your property and assets. It allows you to pull financial resources in one place, a trust, and provide instructions on how to handle those resources when you're no longer able. And a conservatorship or guardianship is not as common as the court actually appoints the conservator. When we uh, get to the question and answer period, I will drop a link in the chat to a financial and legal planning worksheet that's available from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, it's very helpful in assisting you in organizing needing, needed documents um, and taking an inventory of your assets and liabilities. Be sure to consider the costs you may incur in the future. Remember, Alzheimer's is a progressive disease, and the type of level and care needed will intensify over time. Discussing into life wishes with your family is not easy and is usually emotional. It's essential and how others will know your wishes. So use an advanced directive like the living will or five wishes to express your end of life care wishes, including your desire for any life-sustaining treatments while able to make those decisions for yourself. A DNR prevents any attempts at revival, particularly if CPR or defibrillation is needed. Hospice care aims to ensure that symptoms and pain are controlled and that goals of care are discussed and honored. Brain donation to research can provide valuable information to scientists for important research that will help answer questions around Alzheimer's disease and improve treatment for future patients. Finally, making funeral and burial plans ahead of time may reduce the stress of these arrangements for your family during what will be a difficult time. Take care of your physical health and diet with exercise. If diagnosed, embrace a heart healthy eating pattern, such as the Mediterranean diet to help protect the brain, learning new information, taking a class or challenging yourself to try a new hobby or activity may help increase your brain activity. Remember how important that daily routine is for the individual living with Alzheimer's and the caregiver. I love these tips or coping strategies from people living with Alzheimer's. There is a much more extensive list like this available on the Alzheimer's Association website. I can really relate to forgetting whether or not I've washed my hair in the shower. And I love the technique here of moving the bottles from one side of the shelf to the other to keep her brain in check. 
Um, and the matching color shirt to remember what the spouse was wearing in public or in a crowded area is brilliant. Again, please go visit the Alzheimer's Association website. There's a plethora of resources available, checklists, support groups, and much more. If you need help from professional caregivers, I hope you reach out to us at Home Helpers. We're here to help make life easier. Our caregivers do receive specialized training in caring for patients living with dementia, and I'd be happy to discuss that in greater detail offline. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and I'd love to see if we have any questions. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a great presentation. Um, first question is, how did you become interested in developing a service to serve people and caregivers struggling with this condition? Can, can you repeat the first part of it again? Sorry, I'm in the office. I'm wearing a mask. <laughs> oh. How did you become interested in developing a service to serve people and caregivers struggling with the, this condition? Well, um, interested by mostly, you know, identifying the need, seeing that there is that need out there. Um, but when you do find that there are tips and tricks that help, and there are strategies that really can alleviate the stress for the caregiver and help make um, the person living with Alzheimer's and dementia's life more enjoyable, um, able to find those, those good moments and those good days. Um, that, that was really the motivation for me. It's like the, the more people we can share this with, the more people that know, um, ultimately we might be able to reduce the risks of, of um, developing this disease ourselves, um, but mostly to know how to help our family members that are struggling. Great. Um, what are some of the effects that you've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic on people and caregivers living with this condition? I mean, the number one is social isolation. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to be able to still have activities as a part of that daily routine. Um, and so, you know, the, the benefit of, of having in-home care, you know, through the, the COVID pandemic, we've followed CDC guidelines and therefore we've still been able to put caregivers inside the home. Um, that's been a little bit more difficult in facilities um, as lockdowns have occurred and are starting to occur again. Um, there's a few facilities, you know, in the Fort Collins area that, that are on lockdown again right now where family members can't get in there and see their, their parents. Um, and when their parents have dementia, that, that's a tough thing to understand. Um, sometimes it can be hard to get in touch with the staff members as well. Um, so it's, it's just another benefit of being able to stay in, in the home where you can still have contact with the family members and have a caregiver come into a familiar environment. Thank you. Is there a test for the APOE E4 gene? If so, how accurate is it? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I don't have enough of a medical and scientific background to tell you the accuracy, <clears throat> but I do know that um, through genetic testing, you can discover if you have the gene. And if you do, I mean, the, the, since it's not a guarantee that you'll have Alzheimer's, it just increases the risk. The number one thing to do there is to start concentrating on, on the diet, you know, lower cholesterol, more heart healthy exercise and keeping that brain active. All right. And if anyone has questions and they don't want to type them in the chat box, you can feel free to unmute and ask that. Uh, one question we had was, uh, what strategies do you have for dealing with a person with Alzheimer's who is having hallucinations and is just saying things that aren't quite true? How do you sort of redirect them? Well, the first step really is to meet them where they are. Um, you don't necessarily, it's not the right strategy to deny that what they think is happening is happening. Um, so you wanna meet them where they're at um, and try to make them as comfortable as possible. So if it's an hallucination that is bringing them pleasure, that's okay, you can enjoy in it too. Um, I remember a client of ours um, that would look out his window and the way that the blinds created shadows, You know, he, he hallucinated all kinds of things happening in the trees. 
but he actually enjoyed it. It was birds that would never be in Colorado. Sometimes there were people in the trees and there's, you know, what harm does it do? Um, if that's where, you know, he was comfortable at and, and then we could even share a moment and, and share a laugh. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. Many people take statins for high cholesterol. Are there any risk factors between statins and dementia and Alzheimer's? That is one I'll have to research and get back with you. I, I'm not entirely sure on that one. I just dropped in the link to that financial planning worksheet I mentioned that's available on the Alzheimer's Association website. Great, we'll include that in the link for the recording as well, if that's all right, Kate. Absolutely. All righty. Well, if that's all the questions we have, I want to say thank you everyone for joining.